Hi, this is Sean D'Souza, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation Podcast. This podcast isn't some magic trick about how to work less. Instead, it's about how to really enjoy the work that you do and to enjoy your vacation time. Hi, it's Sean D'Souza, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation. Have you ever heard someone saying, I draw like a six-year-old? And there's a lot of truth in that statement because we stop drawing when we're six. And so we draw like six-year-olds. If we stop drawing when we're seven, we draw like a seven-year-old. If we stop drawing when we're eight, we draw like an eight-year-old. When I was a cartoonist, I used to go to schools and I used to show kids how to draw. And when you go into a classroom, you don't find many kids who can't draw, especially when they're very young. You could draw, you know that. Most of us could draw when we were young, and then we lose that ability. That's because we don't practice it, we don't get any instruction, we don't know what mistakes we're making, and so we think that we're not talented. But as you've already suspected, every skill can be made into a considerable talent. And you can draw, write, sing, dance, things that you thought, well, that's way beyond me. It is possible. In this episode, we're just going to look at the definitions of talent, the way I see talent. And this is rerun number five out of six. And I think you'll enjoy this. It's quite hard to get this concept that Talent is something that you can acquire, and you can acquire it very quickly. Not this 10,000-hour song and dance routine. You can acquire it within two, three months, six months. It all depends on the talent itself, the complexity of the talent. Let's find out what this whole talent thing is all about. Let's look at the definitions to start with. These are unusual definitions, so stick around as we go on this trip of talent. Three, two, one. Seven miles per second. That's what it takes for a spacecraft to break out of Earth's orbit. Breaking free of the gravity of Earth and heading into space, it's called escape velocity. It's easily one of the biggest challenges of space travel. The spacecraft needs an enormous amount of fuel to break free of Earth's gravity. The more fuel you have, the more thrust you achieve, but the fuel also adds to the weight of the rocket. It's almost maddening and it's a catch-22 situation that scientists have been trying to solve for so long. And it drives us crazy when we look around us and we see people who are clearly more talented than us. We had this problem when we were in school. Some kids were brilliant at writing. Some were outstanding in maths. And as we grew up, we noticed people who sang better, danced better, They're better artists, better speakers, they pick up languages faster, and then we brush it off. We believe that we were born with certain skills, and it's best to use them to our fullest capacity. The gravity of our situation holds us back. But that's not how scientists look at gravity. For them, gravity is a challenge. Achieving escape velocity, that's simply a matter of breaking through what holds us back. It's always about how to go at seven miles per second in the most efficient manner possible. What you're about to hear is my battle with talent. You may already know some of my skills, writing, drawing, teaching, painting, cooking, and that's what you've seen. You may not know that I'm also an excellent babysitter, I dance exceedingly well, I learn programs, and I know as many as six languages. I actually know a little more, but let's not boast. So that's why I'm telling you this stuff. I'm not trying to impress you. In fact, I started out studying the science of acquiring talent back in the year 2008. 
I'd be sitting in a cafe, someone would walk up to me and tell me how talented I was at drawing. Or I'd be on the dance floor and someone would compliment me about how well I danced. Now compliments are amazing. They spurred me on to get a lot better, but they also drove me crazy. It almost seemed like people were suggesting that I was born with this skill. And so I started on an uphill climb. I wanted to prove that innate talent may not exist. In reality, I don't care whether it exists or not. But it wasn't easy to say it aloud because the very concept of acquiring talent seems improbable. Not everyone can be Michael Phelps, they tell me. Not everyone can be Albert Einstein. The funny thing is, I love pushback. I love it that people kept putting objections in my way because now I had to prove beyond any doubt that talent could be acquired. What made the challenge even more interesting was the concept of 10,000 hours. I was determined to prove that you didn't have to do 10,000 hours. You could acquire a skill in a lot fewer hours than that. But you don't have to believe me. Well, not right away. All I'm asking you to do is to listen to these three definitions of talent. And then I'll have made a little dent in your universe. Or at least that's the theory. So let's get down to this nitty gritty of talent and see why just these three definitions can make you see the world the way I see it. So what are the three definitions? Definition number one is that talent is a reduction of errors. Definition number two is that it's a pattern recognition system at high speed. And definition number three is that talent is only something that you can't do. Now, this is going to be a long episode, so we're going to break it up into two parts. And in the first part, we'll cover the reduction of errors and that it's done at high speed. And then we'll go to the third part in the next episode. Let's start off with the first point, which is talent is a reduction of errors. This is my favorite definition. What does it mean that talent is a reduction of errors? No matter where you look, you find people who have talents in one area or another, except one. So this one area, you're not going to find anyone who's innately talented. Not one person is talented when it comes to riding a bicycle. When you see parents trying to teach kids to ride, they are unable to teach them to ride. They just run wildly behind the kid, they shout out instructions, and of course the kid can't hear anything. After all, that kid is desperately trying to pedal is desperately trying to steer, It's desperately trying not to go into the tree. So no one teaches you to ride a bike, and no one, at least no one I know, was born with the ability to ride a bicycle. Assuming you can ride a bicycle, that leaves us with only one conclusion. Bike riding has X number of errors that you can make, errors that involve steering, pedaling, balancing, etc. And slowly but surely, you started eliminating those errors one by one. The more errors you reduce, the less you crashed into trees. Eventually, as you ironed out most of those mistakes, you were able to sail away down the road and you went around chattering with your friends. Talent is a reduction of errors. When you begin to learn a new skill, you make an enormous number of errors. You've watched a student driver, haven't you? They're learning to drive a stick shift, a manual car, and they lurch back and forth trying to master the skill. But the brain has no reference point to those errors, so it's unable to cope, it's unable to do anything and finds the learning extremely tedious. Now, if you were to ask someone how to learn to drive a car or a bicycle, they would say to you the usual stuff. And they would say, practice, practice, practice. 
Yes, practice, but practice is not the answer. Even deliberate practice is not the answer. Instead, what's needed is an understanding of errors. When the brain consciously or subconsciously knows what errors it's making, it takes corrective action. Take for example the act of dealing with a hot pan. There's only one kind of error that's possible with a hot pan. And yet a two-year-old child may not recognize that glaring error and then head straight for the pan. But once we're aware of the mistake, we take scrupulous care to avoid hot pans. We also avoid stepping in dog poo, potholes, and closed doors. The trick to learning or talent isn't just in practice or deliberate practice. Instead, it's about understanding errors. Once you understand the errors, you are closer to fixing them. Once you've reduced or eliminated the errors, you're effectively talented. An excellent example of error fixing is the website building software called Dreamweaver. If you open Dreamweaver today, you'd find the option of viewing a website into different views, different modes. So you can see the HTML on the left, and then you can see your website, which is a graphical view of your website on the right. Even if you're completely oblivious about HTML, all you need to do is to open up a perfectly good looking website in Dreamweaver. Then you head into the left hand side, which is the HTML, and tweak the text, make some changes. And immediately you see the change reflected on the right hand side. And immediately you know that's an error. So you've got better because you made that error, your brain recognized the error, and then it fixed it. So you've learned from your mistake. Many of us believe that talent is either inborn or is acquired by practice. Instead, it's acquired by a reduction of errors. Everything you do today had a huge error rate at one point in time. Addition, subtraction, spelling, grammar, they were all riddled with errors. When you see people making mistakes as adults, spelling mistakes, basic grammar mistakes, it's not because they don't know how to write, it's because they've never learned that error, they've never learned how to fix that error. So they don't see the error, and if you don't see the error, you can't fix it. And that's why you have all of these grammar problems online. You can't fix a mistake unless you know you're making one in the first place. Take, for instance, my niece Marsha. When Marsha was just three years old, she came to visit us in New Zealand for the first time. At that time, her speech was a little garbled, like three-year-olds. Even so, one of the letters that foxed her was the letter R. Whenever R was prominent, she'd substitute it with Y. So, road became yod, and room became yum. And of course, we only ever yold in the gas, and that's rolled in the grass. If you tried to point out that she was pronouncing R as Y, she would look at you like you were a banana. In her brain, R sounded like Y. Then one day, I decided to speak exactly like her. I didn't say road, I said yod. I didn't say grass, I said gas. Marsha didn't say anything. Or if she did, she probably said it in her gobbled voice and I didn't understand what she said. But within two days, she was pronouncing the R perfectly. Her brain, it seems, was able to detect the error when the word was said incorrectly. And within days and without any training, she was able to fix the problem. That isn't to say that all learning is made through trial and error. The brain is a pattern recognition system and it will learn efficiently enough by just copying patterns.
it's why we learn to speak a language. It's why we adopt the accent of our parents and then we change our accents when we go to school. A good chunk of learning is purely pattern recognition. What holds us back from learning a skill like dancing or cooking or drawing isn't pattern recognition but knowing what we're doing wrong. There's a video online, it's called Austin's Butterfly. It shows a group of very young children appraising the work of one of their classmates, Austin. Austin is probably in the first grade, he's just drawn a butterfly, and there is only one problem. That tiger swallowtail butterfly, it looks amateurish. And the kids know it. At that tender age, they're not about to let Austin get away with such terrible work. Then something quite unusual happens. The teacher takes over and asks the kids to give feedback. One by one they pipe up with their critiques so that Austin can take a crack at the second draft. They point out to the angles, the wings. They ask him to make the wings of the butterfly more pointy. And they go on and on and on. And the illustration improves with every draft. Six drafts later, the butterfly looks like something like in a science book. The finished butterfly is so stunning that anyone, you, me, anyone, would be proud to call that illustration our own. What's at work is simply a reduction of errors. This episode isn't about becoming Michael Phelps. It isn't about becoming Muhammad Ali. We're all tempted to diverge into why we're we not winning gold medals by the dozen at the Olympics. If it's all so easy, why aren't we all winners? And yet, even at that Olympic level, there's only one person that wins the gold medal. Why is this so? Because in the Olympic stadium, let's go to the Olympic pool, for instance, Phelps is often only one hundredth of a second faster than his rival. That's hardly an advantage. The only difference is that Phelps is committing fewer errors. And just for the record, Phelps too was beaten by a much shorter, stockier swimmer from Singapore. On one particular day in one particular race at the Rio Olympics, Joseph Schooling made fewer errors and he won the gold. Talent is merely a reduction of errors. When you reduce the errors, you get talented. But that's only the first definition. What about those that seem innately talented? They do things that we could never hope to do. In the next section, we look at the second definition of talent, where talent is about pattern recognition. It's about pattern recognition at high speed. What is 11 times 13? The answer is 143. What is 11 times 27? The answer is 297. Just for good measure, what is 11 times 45? If you said 495 in a flash, yep, you've got the right answer. However, the chances are that you're slightly flummoxed by the questions. You could clearly see that we were dealing with 11 times table, but it made no sense whatsoever when you had to multiply these random two-digit numbers with 11. And yet, a 10-year-old could do it quite quickly. And I know this to be true because I teach willing 10-year-olds this simple maths trick. Let's start at the top, shall we? Let's look at the numbers. What's 27? 27 is 2 and 7. So we take that 2 plus 7, or we make it 2 plus 7, and we get 9. Now we take that 9 and we stick it in the center. So we had 2 and 7, and we got 9, so that's 2. 9, 7. So what number do you get? 297. What is 11 by 27? 297. You confused? Well, my brain took a little time to work out the system as well. So let's take a simpler example where you already know the answer. What is 11 times 12? You know the answer, right? It's 132. 
So what did we do? We took the one and the two, which comes from 12, and we added it up, we got three, we stuck the three in the middle, and we got one, three, two. So what's 11 times 44? Four plus four is eight. So stick the eight in the center, put the fours at the far ends like bookends, and you get four, eight, four. 11 times 44 is four, eight, four. What is 11 times 33? Yeah, three plus three is six, so it's 363. Once you have this pattern, you can pretty much multiply any two-digit number by 11 and get an answer in seconds. And what you've done is acquired a talent. Now, it's a very small talent, but it's a talent nonetheless. And the way we've gone about this whole thing is to isolate the pattern, roll it out slowly, and then you have the ability. At this point, your brain can figure out the pattern no matter what two-digit number you multiply by 11 and you can get the answer right. A similar concept applies to just about any skill. Take drawing, for example. Many, if not most of us, say that we draw like six-year-olds. And you know what? You're right. You draw like a six-year-old because you stopped drawing when you were six. You can walk into any school on the planet, and you'll find the kids love drawing. Give them a set of crayons, give them chalk, give them even a piece of coal, and they'll be drawing endlessly. But ask them to do maths or grammar, and they look at you weirdly. However, over time, that kid gets a packed lunch and is sent off to school, and the years whiz by, and suddenly those kids are 10 years old. Now, ask them about grammar. Ask them about multiplication tables, and they give you pretty solid answers. But ask them to draw and notice what happens. They draw like six-year-olds. Talent is about pattern recognition. Those kids were given patterns that involved algebra and grammar, so they picked up on those patterns. Music, arts, clay modeling, all the stuff that they did right at the start. Hmm, that's for babies, isn't it? And this is how we go about life. We learn or are given patterns and then we dump the others. Or at least we put them in cold storage. Some patterns are crucial, so we keep refining them. Take eating with a spoon, for instance. When you were one year old, trying to get a spoonful of mashed potato from the plate to your mouth, that was a major issue. Given a chance to do your own thing, the potato mash would be partly on your face, on the ground, on the dining table, everywhere. It would look like a potato war zone. But now? Now you're able to use a fork, you're able to use a knife, you're able to conduct a conversation while trying to look up Facebook on your phone. And you do all of this at the same time. Somewhere along the way, pattern recognition kicked in. What seems like a mundane task of eating a potato was once horribly complicated. But given enough time, given enough pattern recognition, you're now a pro at potato eating. And that's all because this pattern recognition is costly in terms of energy. Think of it as a mansion with lights. When you're first learning something new, you have to turn on every light in the house. It takes enormous energy just to do the simplest task. Over time, your brain figures out the pattern. Instead of every light, it turns on half, then it turns on a quarter of the lights, and finally, it needs that little torch light, maybe, to do whatever task you're familiar with doing. Take, for example, the task of walking. You were hopeless when you started, right? But you don't think of it much now. You can do this walking bit very easily. So do this for me. Stand up and walk across the room and say left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot. Balance, balance, balance. Think about walking. And you'll make it across the room, but your brain is using up so much energy 
that it instantly wants to stop all that chatter. And it does so because it's already worked out the pattern. It needs no power to get you to walk across a room. It requires no additional software to keep that walking going. It knows how to do it. It's worked out the pattern. All the skills you struggle with, they're a matter of pattern recognition. They're a matter of pattern execution. When you see someone that is giving an excellent presentation, you may wonder, how did they become such great speakers? And yet, you're not looking at their feet, are you? If you look at the feet of excellent speakers, they're not randomly moving around the stage. They're purposely moving in a triangular shape from one end to the other. When they get to one edge of the triangle, they stop. They scan the audience from one end to the other and make eye contact. So without saying a word, a speaker would have to learn how to walk, how to stop, how to make sweeping eye contact. These are all elements of pattern recognition. When you look at the speech, it's a series of items that include the graphics, the content, the slides, the structure of the presentation, stories, examples, and crowd control. So if you thought, I'll never be a great speaker, you're right. You're right because there are dozens of elements that the brain has to recognize and then implement. Just walking across the stage might take you a few weeks to master, let alone everything else. All of that pattern recognition has to be in place. It's only when that pattern recognition is in place that you can start to execute. But what about those who pick up patterns instantly? All of us, without exception, pick up patterns very quickly. We do have biases of picking up patterns. Some of us may find reading to be more fruitful than audio. Others may love audio. Some may prefer video and others just detest video. The picking up of a pattern relies strongly on the bias, but also the way the pattern is laid out. A good teacher can get a student to pick up the patterns a lot quicker than a mediocre teacher. Because a mediocre teacher just doles out information. Even so, some of us recognize patterns faster than others. I'll give you this example. There's this guy called Stephen Wiltshire. He is a master of instant pattern recognition. He's an autistic British architectural artist, and he's gained fame because he's able to draw an entire city after just looking at it once. In video after video on YouTube, Stephen draws New York, Rome, London, Singapore, and this is just after a single helicopter ride. His work is so precise that he matches every window, pillar, and doorway. And this is the kind of pattern recognition that most of us refer to when we're talking about talent. We feel that we can't just waltz into a room, pick up any violin, and play complex music. We feel only talented people can do this. Yet, there's a downside to being able to do very complex activities almost instantly. Wilshire, for instance, struggles with everyday activities. He struggles with boarding a train. He struggles with having a long conversation with people. The reality is that we average people, we can achieve a lot of talents in various fields. We might consider ourselves to be pretty average, but with the right teacher, with the right methods, and with the right group, you and I, we can achieve extraordinary limits of talent in, in diverse fields. We don't get this instant ability, of course, but we can achieve all those talents and we can still do our everyday activities with ease. The moment the talent or skill is broken up into isolated pockets of learning, we can quickly pick it up. We can become exceedingly good at that skill. So talent is just pattern recognition. It's just pattern execution at high speed. You know a Picasso is a Picasso because Picasso had a style. And what is style? Yeah, it's just 
science sped up. Picasso may not have been able to explain how his brush work ended up as a piece of art, but the very fact that we recognize it means he had a system, he had a style, and it was all his own. For a forger to replicate a Picasso, all he needs is the blueprint of the pattern. And we might end up buying a very expensive piece of junk because of the replication of that pattern. It's very easy to believe that all talent is inborn, yet almost everything we do today is learned behavior. Our languages, the ability to write, to speak, to walk, to dance, to cook, they're all a style, they're a pattern. And, well, there's no doubt that there is something, some hardware that we're born with. The vast majority of what we can do is all learned through pattern recognition and execution. And this brings us back to 11 by 22. 11 times 22. Do you know what the answer to that is? It's 242. It wasn't as hard as the first time, was it? But what about 11 by 29? Now your brain has to light up and figure out a separate pattern. You have to carry the digit over because 29 is 11. So that's two digits, not one digit. So it adds up and you have to see this on paper because it's complicated in audio. But the answer is 319. So 2 becomes 3 and it's 319. And finally, one last one, which is what is 11 times 99? You'll have to remember that by heart. It's 1089. See, it's a pattern. Find a great teacher who has a great system, who has a great group that's working together and you will magically become talented. No doubt practice will be involved, but it's far less practice than you'd imagine. And the results will be superior to just plodding around on your own. So we finished two definitions of talent. Talent is a reduction of errors. Talent is a pattern recognition system. In the next episode, we will look at something that will stop you in your tracks. It's looking at talent from a way that you probably never imagined in your life, about how talent is just something that you can't do. But let's wrap up this episode and let's go to a summary. So what did we cover in this episode? What we covered were two things. The first thing was that talent is a reduction of errors. The problem is that we don't know what the errors are. Once we know what the errors are, we're able to see them, we're able to reduce them, and we become talented. We see this on several of our courses, whether you look at copywriting, whether you look at article writing, you look at any of the skills, and they're very diverse skills. They're not even slightly connected with each other. And Yet when you look at them, what all the clients are doing, all the people in the course are doing, is they're given a task to do, but they're not just given the how-to, but they're given how not to. So in many of our courses, what we do is we make them do the how-to, but then we get them how not to. So how to write a headline, but then there is a mistake-making week where you break the headline. And so you recognize the pattern. You recognize when you're writing a bad headline by writing a bad headline, but knowing what the good headline is. And it's very hard to write bad headlines after that. So a lot of training that you see around you is all about how to. And how to is not enough because how to doesn't teach you what the mistakes are. Everyone tells you, you should learn from your mistakes. Well, what are the mistakes? It's not like you go to school and they have a mistake making session, is it? So you've got to work out the mistakes. And a good teacher does that. A good teacher will make you make the mistakes, will point out the mistakes, will set you through a mistake making opportunity. And then you fix your mistakes and you reduce the errors and you become talented. It takes time, 
but it doesn't take as much time as what you'd read in a book. You know, you'd read that you have to do deliberate practice and you have to have thousands of hours and 10,000 hours and whatever hours. You don't have to do that. You have to know the mistakes. If you know the mistakes, you can do that in a fraction of the time. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that it is pattern recognition. Everything that you see when you see an artist painting, what they have worked out is a bunch of patterns and then they run it at high speed and then it looks like art to you. When you look at a programmer programming at high speed, it was just a bunch of patterns. They had small patterns, which became bigger patterns, which became more complex patterns. And then they roll it out and it looks like, wow, this person was born to code, but it's not true. What also plays a big role is how that person was taught. So all of us have different methods of learning. And if you're taught in a way that allows you to learn quickly, then you have that pattern in your head. And most of us have this stuff. We have this ability, but then we are put into a situation where it's one size fits all. And we have to work around that. And in trying to work around, say, what we learned in school, well, that takes up so much energy. We are frustrated. We don't like to learn that subject. We don't like maths. We don't like English. We don't like that. And the reason why we don't like it is because we are not given the pattern that we like. Once we get that pattern, it's simple. It's like Dreamweaver. Left-hand side, right-hand side. You can see the changes you're making. You can see where you're breaking it. You can see where you're making it. It's not that hard. So that's what we've covered today. And that brings us to the end of the episode and we go straight into psychotactics land. What's happening in psychotactics land? On the 21st of July, we had the release of the Info Products course. That was just 35 copies and that's done now. The only thing that remains is the article writing course and that's for the 18th of September. To get on that list, that waiting list, because the only way you can get contacted is through the waiting list, you have to go to psychotactics.com slash X article. That's the letter X and article. And get on the list and then we'll notify you. And if all works and you meet with our due diligence, then you'll be one of 35 people to get the article writing home study for this year. It might sound like a marketing gimmick, but Renuka actually goes through the list before she finally approves you for any of the home study courses or even the live courses. So we go through a due diligence process. We want the best clients that we can possibly have. We don't want just random people. And so we have a due diligence process and you'll find that we don't talk about it anywhere else. You have to be on the waiting list to get the notification and that's for the 18th of September. So psychotactics.com slash X article, that's where you'll find the waiting list. The other thing that we're bringing out this year is how to get an idea. And a lot of people ask this question, how do I get an idea? I wanna start up a business, or I already have a business, but I wanna get some more ideas. How do I get that idea? And this is the kind of book that I've had to write for a very long time and I've been putting it off because there have been other courses and other projects that I've been doing. Well, now it's the 25th of November and on the 25th of November, we're going to have that how to get an idea book. But on the 18th of October, that's when you can purchase the book. So you want to mark that out. Other than that, we will be still on vacation while this podcast is going out and we will come back and we'll be back in 5000 BC. I hope that you've made your way to 5000 BC and you've signed up there because if you have, then when we come back, we'll show you some photos of the trip and the stuff that we've done, but then we'll get back to business and you can... You can pitch in there, you can ask your questions, get your answers, work with the community. It's a place where the motto is be kind, be helpful, or be gone. I think you really love 5000BC, so check it out. That's 5000BC.com. 
And that's me, Sean D'Souza, saying bye for now. Bye-bye. Still listening? One of the things about talent is the whole factor of energy. And I've not really addressed it in this podcast. It's a book that I want to write. And it's going to be called The Talent Equation. Well, that's the term for it right now. And in that, there are three parts. The first part is about energy. The second part is about skill. And the third part is about confidence. These are the three elements that I think have to be in place if you want to achieve that talent factor. One of the reasons why kids learn so quickly is not because they're more talented than you. An adult can outdo a kid. You know, you give an adult to play the piano and give a kid to play the piano and an adult does it better every single time. But here's the thing. We don't have the time and we equate it as time, but in fact it's energy. And energy comes from planning. And you'll get a feeling for what I mean by energy when you listen to this little clip by Holly Chantel. And Holly talks about how she uses the factor of outlining to preserve that energy. I've talked about it on a previous podcast. It's like a chef. You actually go through phases so that you preserve the energy and you're at your highest energy when you're creating something. That's how you start to build up that skill. Over to Holly. So I have been very, very stuck with writing articles. I love writing and I have a lot of content that I want to share. I actually have a little notebook full of topics. But what's been happening is is I literally sit at my screen and I just stare at it (laughs) and don't get anything done, start working on other things and and, um, end up, you know, just kicking myself later because I haven't written an article in or a newsletter in weeks. Um, So after listening to the podcast, uh, I think you did a series on um, article writing and you talked about breaking up, outlining, writing the content and editing in different time blocks. Um, I printed out a little sheet for myself with the outline, um, basically the high points of the topic. And now it takes me about 15 minutes to outline and I usually do it right at the end of the day um, so that I have a time limit. And then the next day, it takes me about 30 minutes to write the article. And then the next day, it takes me about 30 minutes to edit. And it's just been this amazing thing. I wrote three articles last week after, I think, probably written three in the last, you know, maybe four months. (laughs) So that was pretty, pretty awesome. And I I just get so much information out of these podcasts. It's, It's pretty incredible. I think that right now I, you know, I, I have a system in place and I'm going to try to create the habit myself, but having uh, the course, it kind of forces you into the habit. Um, you know, you have skin in the game with the money you paid for the course. You have skin in the game with the teams or the groups that you're in of, you know, having to stay accountable to them and also, um, you know, helping them on their journey. You, you're kind of both responsible for each other. Um, so that I think would be that intense experience, even though it it doesn't sound like a whole lot of fun having <laughs> not sleeping for three months. Um, but I think it's something that you know, when you come out at the end, at the end, you have something, a skill and a habit um, that'll just make article writing so much easier going forward. So energy, energy does matter, and planning your work is going to make a difference. And this is one of the things that I make sure that every bun. Not every bun, every one on the article writing course goes through where the planning becomes more interesting or more important than the article writing itself. That's me, Sean D'Souza, saying bye for now. Bye-bye.